take 15 minutes if I'm nervous and 20 if I can relax a little bit. And my purpose is to pique your curiosity as to the uh, potential for Lacan to shed light on interactive electronic music from a viewer's uh, perspective. My name is David Schwartz. I'm uh, on the music theory faculty at the College of Music, University of North Texas. I teach music theory classes across the entire curriculum from undergraduate introductory courses to doctoral seminars. Uh, I have two books, and in, in each of those, my work has been aimed at theorizing listening as a threshold crossing phenomenon among three different registers. The musical work at hand, uh, the historical and cultural context in which it was written, produced, and received, and lastly, structures in the psyche that make it possible to apprehend music in the first place. So the music I have written about in the past has been both classical and popular, both very high and very low, written between the late 18th century and the late 20th century, the period of historical modernism. And I've, I've been alive long enough to feel that 20 years ago, I wouldn't have said, 20 years ago I would have said historical modernism is late 18th century to the present. And uh, now I think we're pretty clearly emerging from that period of, uh, of, of modernism into what some people call post-history and post-humanism, which I find fascinating. The structures in the psyche I've, I've grown to love and talk and write about are via semiotics, the psychoanalytic writings of Lacan, and in particular, post-Lacanian writers, uh, French, American, and British, writing in, in the 60s. And what I'm going to do is give you some very, very broad introductory remarks about Lacan and then narrow in fairly precisely to a few ideas about uh, a, a, few, a few pieces. This triangle is a very famous illustration of the three, three central categories of Lacanian psychoanalysis that I, that I love to use. It's deceptively simple, actually. Here's one way to tell the story of this triangle, which is that we are all born into a disorganized mass of body parts and sensations, which can be called the real. And as we develop, we find ourselves increasingly in a body of sorts. And these post-Lacanian theorists of the 60s have been exquisitely subtle in describing exactly what, that, what happens in various kinds of envelopes. Sonorous envelopes, thermal envelopes, and tactile envelopes into which uh, the newborn immediately finds itself, including, well, including a wide range of developments that culminate in the imaginary order, which is Lacan's, which is typified by Lacan's famous mirror stage, which occurs, we, we all went through it, from six months of age to a year and a half, this experience that, that you can easily see with children when they just can't believe how pleasurable it is to be held up to a mirror and see their reflections in it. Um, and that mirror can be a phenomenal mirror, it can be a pool of water, it can be the face of the mother or the face of the other. The imaginary order is the world of binary oppositions, primarily visual, of identification. So if you're in a purely imaginary mode, you immediately apprehend the fullness of the mother or you feel her utter absence. So it's mutually exclusive binary oppositions of fullness, lack, presence, absence, light, dark, love, and hate. And one of Lacan's greatest achievements, I think, is in his seven-page essay on the mirror stage to point out that the reason human beings develop language is because we make a mistake early in the mirror stage of thinking that that reflection in the mirror really is our ideal other. And gradually, as we learn how to stand up on our own, we, we tap at the mirror and realize, oh, it's just a flat, two-dimensional uh, representation. And for Lacan, that propels us toward the symbolic, which is the world of language. So the symbolic order, to let me reverse this little narrative, is the world in which we're living right now. We live in it all the time. It's the world of language, of codes, of conventions, of law, of social space. When we pay our taxes, pay our rent, do our jobs, we're living in a highly constructed symbolic universe. Uh, three things I think are important and interesting to remember about this structure. A, it is an actual narrative through which all human beings develop. That's a premise which one can call in question, but we, we all were born here and we move in this direction. 
Second, nobody has direct access to any of those experiences because once you arrive in the world of language, you have already passed through the is and they're long gone, right? In other words, so the entire Lacanian topography is a retrospective fantasy that we tell ourselves and others in social space as ways of trying to reach these elusive past experiences. And the third thing I think is also very important to realize is that we did, this is not a diachronic series of events. Like, you know, first I land at the airport, then I find Stein, and then I move into the guest house. That these are, these are phases that build upon each other like rings around a tree, right? So the, the real is at the core of all aspects of human existence. The imaginary is like another ring around it, and then the symbolic, another ring around that. Also, I think what's, what's very interesting about Lacan is that these three dimensions are in very different logical classes. In other words, we live in the symbolic all the time. It's the fabric of our lives, to paraphrase an American ad about cotton. And there are plenty of imaginary vestiges in human experience, falling in love, immediately having a certain sensation about a person as an imaginary. You have absolutely no direct access to the real. The real is everything else. It's everything that's left. In other words, if we took the experience of being in this room and we subtracted all of our knowledge about what's happening here, about what it means to be an individual human being, about what the lights mean, pieces of furniture, if we felt all of this stuff without the symbolic network in which we live and without the imaginary binary binaries that make it possible for us to simply focus on a person against the background, we would be left with pure psychosis. I mean, it would be an unbelievably scary thing to do. So, I think it's important not to romanticize the real. It's, uh, it's extremely terrifying. Um, one of the reasons I'm excited about working, I'm working on a book, I hope will be a book about Lacan and interactive electronic art, is because this presence, this presence of the real creates a kind of common ground to an awful lot that's going on in interactive art, actually. Because I think, I think for a number of reasons. First, there's a tremendous amount of turning the conventionality of art inside out in the kind of work that we that Tom just played, for example. There is a tremendous emphasis on the immediacy of performance and the body, particularly the body informed with various prosthetic devices of technology, such as what this institution right here is all about. And I think the real, particularly in showing the potential of opening up a fabric of the imaginary and the symbolic, is, is a very fortuitous analytical device for addressing the kinds of issues that we, were, that we just talked about 20 minutes ago, actually, with regard to that musical instrument feedback and the way in which it's molded in, in, in real time and uh, in real space. I just went way off my script. I'm not used to doing this. It's fine. So, just as in my previous work, I like to talk, talk about listening as a, as a kinetic articulation of crossing thresholds between a work of art, its historical context, and the mind. I also think these are not just stationary characters. You don't show up and say, okay, here's a snapshot of the imaginary. Here's a little snapshot of the symbolic, and here's a snapshot of the real. What I find really interesting about this is to imagine these lines as uh, trajectories of transformation with various arrows, right? So you, you can go from the real to the imaginary, the imaginary to, the, to the symbolic. And the reason, okay, I, 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 I decided when I came to Stein, I've been here for a month writing the introduction to what I hope to be this book, Interactive Electronic Art. I have 75 works of art that I found online that I bookmarked, so those are gonna be the body of, of the book. And after a couple, it's extremely difficult to write an introduction to something like this because there's no single point of entry into psychoanalysis. There's no single point of entry into inter interactive electronic art also. So the first draft of this introduction turned out to be quite a nightmare because it was, turned out to be this rhizome of infinite grass that sort of started from nowhere and ended, ended nowhere. And I had an epiphany that I should just simply describe what it's like to be here and to take the concert that took pl place in this very space on August 5th as a test case. So I was here. There was this concert on August 5th. And it, it, you know, I won't talk. I, I, I've written a draft and I've talked about various aspects of these three performances and I want to show them to you today. So now I'm going to start to narrow down. I've got video clips of the, uh, of the three performances, each with a repetition of this triangle. 
because the red thread of continuity in the next five minutes or ten minutes of my presentation is going to be to suggest various inscriptions of the real into these into these three these three works. The first work was Leslie Flanagan, a young sound artist from New York. She created a wonderful work of sound sculpture, I think, by controlling feedback in a live environment. And here is a minute or so of the very beginning of Leslie's performance. I don't think it's coming out of here. It's coming out of my machine. Right. Is it coming out of here? I think it's just coming out of this. She is using this transformational trajectory. She's taking a sound that for many of us is a signifier of a glitch, right? A microphone moving, producing feedback. And, and much of the performance involved Leslie taking full, uh, splendid example of that kind of glitch that we are so familiar hearing in lectures, right? Somebody moves a microphone and that makes this huge feedback and noise and there's an apology and then people, then the normal lecture starts. And I think what Leslie is doing in this performance is she's turning that kind of uh, glitch or that kind of mistake inside out and peeking at the real beneath. So I, I, I think that this kind of gesture is what, what this piece is all about. And there were, there were lovely little moments there. You could actually hear her move. It was at 38 seconds, I think, where you get that typical, that typical sound of uh, moving a microphone and hearing, hearing feedback. Plus, when she put her hand on this object that was producing feedback, it, it reproduced an octave higher. So it was as if there was a kind of electronic falsetto, right? a kind of electric yodel going there from, from the machine. And the piece is full of all kinds of wonderful, wonderful puns like that. Um, but you know, if you could take a symbolic entity such as the conventional context in which we usually hear noise produced by a moving microphone, if you could turn it inside out. And peek, and, and peek at the real, if the real were actually a, a, an entity with some ontological consistency, you, could only, you, you would only need to do that once, and you can say, okay, crack it open, and there's the real. But of course, what happens to the real is the real immediately gets cannibalized by the symbolic. So what happens is it, it immediately becomes an entity with which we're familiar. So I, I think what happens every time there's a kind of evocation of feedback and um, noise in a, in a piece like this, we hear the we, we we get a glimpse of the real at the very beginning of a noise, right? So it's a threshold phenomenon that you hear right at the beginning, and I think psychologically that explains the need to hear it over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, I think it was very pleasurable to hear this performance, and I think every time there was a, there was an evocation of a kind of feedback loop, a kind of noise, you could you could sense a kind of glimpse at the real over and over and over again. Yeah. You just described the feeling of pleasure when you heard this. Uh -huh. Where would that feeling of pleasure fit in on this diagram? Uh, well, that particular feeling of pleasure just simply accompanies this trajectory. Um, it, it's an excellent question, and I wrote at some length uh, about you know, what it means to find that pleasure. I mean, what is the, what is the, what is the nature of that, of that kind of pleasure? There are a number of possibilities. I'm going off script and I don't want to take too long, but it's a great question. So since you asked it, I'll well, to me, that's what's real about the musical experience is that you have an emotional response to it that's personal. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, you can you can only be pleased with a glimpse at the real a if you have a fascination with the death drive, or in a more mainstream way, if there's something pleasurable about opening up a kind of dangerous realm so that you can then control. You can then control your reaction to it. So it's like the, it's like the magnetic attraction of 
looking over a cliff, you know, which would be death if you fell over it. And then, you, you know, it's, it's sort of pleasurable in a kind of sublime way to feel the pull of that enormity and the threat, and yet to master it and to stand there. Uh, and frankly, that's, that's the kind of pleasure I feel in an awful lot of music, and I'm, I, mean, I like that. I think it's, uh, yeah. So we're not, you know, you could be a moth flying into the flame if that's all you wanted to do was to invoke the real and just live there. But I think most of us don't want to do that. Most of us want to maybe feel the heat and then pull back. And that, that's a kind of pleasure, I think. Uh, plus, I think there's something, uh, there's a kind of pleasure in resisting conventionality that, uh, that, that, uh, that an approach to the real suggests. So I, 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 I personally think it's, it's productive and interesting to think of very fleeting approaches to the real. I mean, what happens, what happens in, in, in personal, psychic, and cultural space is the real appears in moments of crisis. When everything is fine, you don't feel real. You, you live in the symbolic and imaginary. But in moments of personal crisis or in moments of confronting an extraordinary work of art that vastly exceeds one's own capacity to understand it, or I think culturally, we're, we're living in a, in a, in a in a period, whatever this post-historical, post-human era is, where the real appears an awful lot. I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's a cultural force, actually. I think it's behind quite a, quite a bit of politics, actually, in my own country and elsewhere. Well, so, for Leslie, for Leslie Flanagan, I, I feel this kind of trajectory. And let me show you next. Pirks, I think it's pronounced Pirks, Maciek Sledzitsky, I think, and Marion Rurla. A very different take, I think, on what happens when you transform the sound of an electric guitar uh, with a computer. This is the first few, this is the first minute or so of their performance. I'm sorry the video was so dark because it would be nice to see the physicality with which Machek was playing the guitar because I think that's very important. So for me, what we just heard is exactly the opposite trajectory. <clears throat> you start with having taken apart the sound of the, of the electric guitar, having you know dragged the pick horizontally across the spiral. So you heard that wonderful little percussive sound, the slaps. You know, the, uh, the dive bombing techniques that Hendrix would have loved, right? That sound like the, uh, his take on the Star Spangled Banner from Woodstock. 
And then gradually throughout the piece, I didn't want to talk about what was going on because I wanted you to enjoy it, but there were, there were gradually recognizable pitches. There was gradually a riff, and then a loop of that minor third bomb, the bottom, you know, really low down, suggesting a kind of funk blues entering. So gradually, I think what happened in this clip was, was a, a single move along the trajectory of the real and the symbolic, where the conventional sounding of the electric guitar kind of um, the real released into it. So for me, for me, that's that's what that's what these guys are doing at least at this moment um, in that piece. Although there are other possible takes on it as well. So let me let me conclude with one more. This is uh, Desert Fathers. Uh, Jeff Kaiser, trumpet. Gregory Taylor, computer. This is a minute toward the end. <laughs> It's so dark. You see a close up of Gregory Taylor, then the video camera zooms out. You see Jeff doing this. Oh man, it's too bad. shows is how problematic and I think fascinating it is to figure out who was responding to whom. I mean, what, what's really, what fascinated me about this piece is the relationship between the two different instruments. So I heard it as a kind of take on a call and response, a kind of conversation of, of sorts for which, um, you know, the Lacanian model has a magnificent uh, container, which is the acoustic mirror which is a field of study that those post-Lacanians in the 60s have been exploring. It occurs in childhood development between the, uh, shortly after birth and like the, the uh, 12th week of life, where the four innate cries with which we are all born, the innate hunger cry and the cry of uh, anger, pain, and frustration, which are acoustic derivatives of the hunger cry, apparently, um, form the first basis of communication when a few weeks after life, we all get, we all understand that we can utter a cry for attention, and it's the cry for attention that can appear in as early as the third week of life, which post-Lacanian psychologists in France think, and I think it's a really great idea, is the model for human communication. It's the first thing we intentionally do to get a response from the other, and it, it pr provides a magnificent model for uh, language acquisition. I mean, it suggests that the this, this signifiers that we usually think of as language actually piggyback on the kind of pre-linguistic exchange of sounds in the acoustic mirror phase. It's turned out to be used to explain various phenomena in film music and in ambient music. And one of the one of the really interesting things I find about the acoustic mirror is a kind of uh, 
disagreement about exactly the way in which acoustic recognition of the sound emitted by the other leads to language acquisition. The, the post lacanian French school, they all agree that the acoustic mirror lays the groundwork for language acquisition, but they're not quite sure exactly how. And the rogue element is how we process sounds that are not reflected by the other. Right? So the acoustic mirror takes place with this sense in which our sounds are echoed by the sound of the other. Right? There's a kind of exchange. You can imagine like self, other. There's an arrow that goes back and forth between the two. That's cool. That's fine. That was developed in the conversation. That was happening right now. I'm talking to the ear of hearing. But there are other sounds that, that don't meet their, that don't meet that destination. Right? That sort of drift off or drift back into the real. And it's that binary that I think a work such as this really um, interestingly exploits. I, I think there are certain sounds that are traded back and forth between the trumpet and the computer, and there are others that's, that, that, that sort of miss their mark or drift away. Now, I confess I made a, I made a huge mistake in interpreting this piece. I, I wrote a first draft of a passage on this, and I sent it to Jeff and Gregory. And I, I, I had described the sound of the trumpet, which seemed to me obviously to be fed into Gregory Taylor's computer. And I, I thought it was totally obvious and kind of brilliant the way in which he manipulated those sounds and spit them back, sometimes in a kind of call and response and sometimes more or less intentionally or whatever, missing their mark. So I thought the piece lived for me in this binary of sounds uh, arriving at their destination, some of them and others not. Turns out that's not, not the case at all. There's, there is, is absolutely no direct processing of the live trumpet sounds in Gregory, <laughs> Gregory Taylor's computer. <clears throat> so what I thought was collaborative play was in fact parallel play. Which is, at first I was mortified and embarrassed, but uh, now I think it's, it's kind of an interesting mistake to have made because it doesn't really change. It's changed. Well, I made a mistake. Clearly, okay, if they say so, there was parallel play. You know, Jeff Kaiser was doing this, and there was some processing going on over here. Gregory Taylor was doing this thing with sounds that I, I can't not believe they had nothing to do with what Jeff Kaiser was doing. But uh, I, I still think there's a kind of acoustic mirroring going on with the sounds meeting and colliding in the middle and then drifting off uh, off into space. So I've, I've now gone over time. And rather than rather than conclude with any with a sort of synthesis, which I can't do in such a short period of time, uh, I, I hope this kind of approach helps in simply helping us as listeners, as uh, you know, people who go go to concerts and, and love music, to uh, figure out a way of understanding it. Because I, I, I was aware at the August 5th concert of just an unbelievable ocean of data flowing at me, you know, hitting the skin, hitting your ears, uh, hitting your eyes. And I think if I'm honest, a, a tiny, 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 tiny percentage of it actually left a, uh, an impression. And I, I think it's through, you know, the criticism can work really well if it gives you the, the uh, conceptual grid for simply gathering more, holding on to more. And it's my hope in this tiny little presentation in the, in the book I hope to write to, uh, to give us some tools for, for doing that. So. It's been a long evening, and thanks, but I would love some responses, questions. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can clear up for me from the beginning. You had mentioned the, the I mean, we know the real imaginary symbolic. And they're not static places, however, you said you pass from the real, you pass through the imaginary to the symbolic. Right. And then you mentioned that uh, they're kind of, I guess, I was, I imagine it brings on a tree, yeah. you know, the one and the other. And then you talk about binaries, and when I envision that kind of uh, circular model that's out, I imagine more of a kind of post structuralist model. Right. Because you keep mentioning, well, you can kind of go back to the imaginary, or then you mentioned one of the performance kind of invokes the real. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just not sure that those concepts um, from from the beginning, how you said you kind of go through. Yeah, they don't map onto each other very well, I'm sorry. No, no, that's OK. But yeah, so maybe you can speak a bit more um, in terms of 
have how you come from the conclusion of you kind of pass through each, but then you can invoke. Yeah, I mean, we pa- I think we pass through each in a, in a, in a heartbeat, really, because we arrive here when we're one and a half, basically, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's sort of the, I mean, we learn language slowly from the very first battles, but, uh, you know, Freud's for Da, which, you know, this peekaboo game, the, the other quintessential thing that all children love, and one of Freud's greatest uh, realizations is that the Fort Da game in- inaugurates us into language. And um, one thing that, w- I'm not sure if this is going to answer your question very well, but one thing I, I love thinking about in terms of the symbolic is that it's, a, uh, it's, an imperfect, it's an imperfect compromise between the brutal binaries of the imaginary. I mean, if we only lived in the imaginary order, we'd be ecstatic or unbelievably, horribly abject all the time. And we would flip back and forth. I know people like that, actually. And, <laughs> right? I'm sure we all know some pathological people who are like overly binary in terms of their moods. I actually think they have a little bit too much of the imaginary, seriously. But I think it's, it's uh, anyway. So if this, is a, if this is a world of mutually exclusive binary oppositions, what the symbolic gives us is a world of grays. So this is black and white, and the symbolic always gives you something but never gives you everything. That's what words do, that's what language does. Right? It can be really, really beautiful. Poetry is unbelievably exquisite. But you, but you can evoke an orange forever and never quite feel what it tastes like. And I think that's, that's, that's both the great uh, genius of the symbolic order. It's what keeps us sane, I think. Right? It always gives you something but it never gives you everything. And I think what you, were in, what you were interested in is the difference in logical classes among them, which the metaphor of the tree really violates. It's really kind of a, an unfortunate metaphor. I like to use the metaphor of the tree just to make it clear that we, you, can, you can move back from the symbolic. And we, we do this all the time in various sort of, sorts of identifications, in sort of binary identifications. We all, have that, we all have imaginary structures in us. And at certain moments, uh, you know, the real can open up, which is this total formless void, the brute thingness of things, uh, you know, the brute thingness of things. Uh, one of Lacan's favorite uh, metaphors in the real is the pulp flesh beneath the face. Cindy Sherman has a magnificent photograph, which it's as if she knew that Lacan had said that. I don't know if you notice it's red and it's got all sorts of plastic body parts and it's an eyeball and a little piece of skin. Perfect description of the way Lacan evokes the real. And uh, I, I was reminded of that at the beginning of the uh, Pyrrhus performance because it sounded like the pulp flesh beneath the face of the electric guitar. But in any case, this is, this is a world of formlessness, binary. And depending on how you think about language, uh, Lacanians and post structuralists and Derridians are very fond of undoing the, the neat binary that Saussure would have. Saussure here, he'd say, okay, you got signifiers and signifieds. The sign is this nice, neat little egg where you have a, a mark that points to a conception of an object, which was, at the time, a radical and brilliant idea. Um, and I, uh, I think Lacan, he says it all over the place, the symbolic is our signifiers that point to that point in all sorts of scattered trajectories to all kinds of meanings that are constantly floating away from us. I may have done a bad job answering your question. No, that's great. I think we've been eating about this for hours. So no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just had a um, question about um, um, because I'm very interested in spirituality and, and a lot of my own work, but it seems to me like the symbolic is could all be replaced with the word the ego and the real could be was replaced with you know what some spiritual writers and, and yes. faiths would call um, yeah, yeah, yeah. God or uh, I am or right. like the the um, quantum physics it would be the you know the, the field um, that's beyond the, the smallest particle of matter. Like, right. So you haven't mentioned anything um, Metaphysical or spiritual relationship to this model, but are there writers that write about what we can model from that perspective? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can't bring up bibliographical. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do believe that there's nothing new under the sun in a way, and I, mean, I think the real has been with us in different guises forever. I think uh, moving back the uh, the uh, German 
the philosophical tradition of the late 18th and early 19th century, the thing in itself, the thing in sich, is a kind of real. The Kantian sublime, talk about, now we're talking about that, is definitely a way, of, is Kant's real. I think if Kant and the Kant could sit down, they would have a great conversation. And um, I think it does appear at, at times of crisis, actually. So the late 18th century, I think, is a fortuitous time in Europe for an evocation of a kind of impossible, pure sensation locked in the subject, not of the object. It's, it's kind of real. In the Middle Ages, religious doubt, skepticism, is a kind of medieval way of understanding the realism. And I, I, I like to think of it as this terrifying pulp underneath objects, but it, it, some people do give it a very positive dimension, and you're right, because the yeah, real can suggest a positive or a negative sublime. It can be heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're all going there, you know? It'll be this wonderful, blissful, pure, immediate nirvana. Or not. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I think the way we experience it is pretty terrifying. So, so Peter, you're saying that the time really is why the Thai wanted to stare at the sun. Why you wanted to? Why the Thai would want to stare at the sun in order to... Oh, absolutely. In order to transcend yes. ordinary reality. Yeah, absolutely, I think so. Yeah, I think it can be pretty seductive, pretty, pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, and I, I frankly think in some of the, in, 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 I was enjoying in Tom's performance little little pieces of the real, of, uh, of sounds that were a little threatening, where I was a little afraid of uh, being pierced. I think there's an awful lot of that around these days. I'm not sure I agree with this um, access of the real. It's in, in a music performance, or you mentioned more in a society in general, there's more of it kind of being accessed or provoked. What don't you What don't you believe? I feel like it's a, it's a simulation of the real that's being provoked. I'm not sure if the real could possibly be provoked. I think that's brilliant. I think that's absolutely that's probably right because. If, if, if the real really exists as a kind of pre-symbolic nothingness, it absolutely cannot be named. And at the moment when you think you're naming it, it escapes. So that's absolutely brilliant what you just said. I think it's absolutely right. And that's, that's why this very, this very common phrase occurs in Lacanian criticism, the missed encounter with the real. It's throughout Zizek's work. The, the, the mist. The mist. You're right, M-I-S-S-E-D. So it's, it's something that slips away. I mean, no matter, even if you want to, to feel it, as soon as you grab onto it, as soon as you have anything of consistency in your hand, in your ear, wherever, in language, in word, it is already domesticated. I was trying to get a little bit at that when I suggested that it's a threshold phenomenon that evaporates immediately. So you, you, can, only, you can only glimpse it, but you're absolutely right. <coughs> So I don't, I don't want you to be too slippery in my response, but I, I do believe so could you, Sorry, could you just add a little, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the musical performances, uh -huh. in terms of that, in terms of how... Uh, how does it work with any of these examples? For yeah. example, right at the beginning of the Pyrrhic's, the Pyrrhic's performance, when you hear Machek with all those gestures, uh, for me, there was, a, there, was a, there was just the edge of a kind of discomfort, a kind of pleasure, and a kind of um, repulsion is too strong a word, but I didn't know whether to like or dislike the, the sort of immediate physicality of those gestures that seemed to be intended to produce sound and were about evacuating sound, turning it absolutely inside out until he gradually let it swarm back in. So that's the slightest the slightest threshold at the very beginning of that piece for me was just the slightest edge of the real. And if one could open it up and actually experience it, it would be some kind of pure, physical, immediate, unnameable gesture that threatens one's bodily consistency, <laughs> right? Which one cannot even imagine. But. Well, I'm having a 
hard time understanding what real is. So if I'm encountering something that I've never seen before, never heard before, is that real for me until I can identify what it is? Yeah, like yeah. The scraping of something if I've mm -hmm. never heard it before. That's an important point. I was, and I was thinking in that during uh, Tom's performance, for example, how different kinds of people would respond differently to, you know, feedback, for example. I mean, there are many mainstream concert goers who would find it just simply noisy. They would find it all kind of awful and real and undigested and unprocessed. So, so the noise is not real because you know what noise is. You 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 know your perception of what noise is is. Either is it already symbolic? I, I'm not understanding how we go back from there being, you know, from being symbolic to real. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, some, the symbolic dimension of noise would involve a memory of having heard something similar in the past. It would involve an aesthetic judgment. It would involve a word that might be a little bit more differentiated than noise. It might place noise in a, in a historical context. It might place noise in a personal context. Those are all these symbolic dimensions of, of noise. And if you if you if you could if you could feel it and you had no word for it, to that extent it would be it would, it would be edged with the real. And I, I just think so much of this interactive electronic art is playing with that threshold. I think that that's so much about what's, what's, what's going on, at least unconsciously, in so much of this work, is taking this, this new continent that came up in the Zanakis quote, I think, this new territory of sound and mapping it. And uh, it, it, becomes, it becomes tamed, it becomes symbolic. So it's and, human nature trying to Categorize things. Yeah. Oh, I analyze things. Yeah, psychoanalytically, I think it's in human nature to understand things and to categorize them and to master them. Do you think it's a part of uh, maybe just our culture? Yes. Or all cultures? I, one, I would be more responsible to say our culture. Yeah. yeah. And you would get that too. Well, maybe I one. think. Yeah. Right, uh, that there, there are other cultures that might not be quite as low centric as ours no. who would have a completely different take. I just uh, get this really strong response about, you know, I, I see, because I read a lot about different philosophical um, systems of faith and spirituality, it's, it seems like uh, uh, the mapping uh, like, um, of, of a, a non religious or non spiritual thought process, uh, um, secular, if you like. Um, logical brain talking about exactly the same thing that a religious person would be talking about, and and this this drive to let go of everything symbolic um, uh, uh, to get back to purity is is this in, impulse to enlightenment, a Buddhist might say, or to um, heaven, a uh, um, Muslim might say, or uh, follow the plan. Right. And, and so I, I I just am just really excited about. Um, the similarities in parallels. I think it's really interesting. I should have said it's straight white male Western European culture. <laughs> <laughs> what our experience is sort of very primal sounds like the howling of a wolf or the sound of a nightingale. That would that kind of experience be what you would call real because it's something that's sort of innate? You feel something when you hear those noises perhaps uh, I, I, I don't know. Well, that's not innate. Perhaps. I, I would I would see that as highly inscribed in, in, in cultural context. But I don't know. I don't mean to pronounce truths and like that. The question of what's innate is is, uh, is extremely interesting. Um, I come across it all the time in, in teaching music. You know, what is what is what is culture specific? What is uh, culturally contingent? What is uh, necessary? What is contingent in human responses? And uh, it, it, you know, 20 years ago, it was considered totally reactionary to say there are some transcendent things that we all experience. Yeah, completely reactionary. Right? It's all like the fear of heights. Like you put a baby over a pane of glass, if you yeah. feet above the ground, it will cry because it perceives the distance between where it is and the ground and knows there's something to be afraid of about that. Right? Yeah. We'll never we'll never answer that question, but I mean there is something about living in flesh that responds in a certain way really to great cold and great heat and pain. I I my question is trying to get at, at whether sounds like that have this quality that you're calling the real? I would call them the real if they're, if they're uh, outside your culture. I think. 
Or if you, if you, if you really can't identify the source, if you can feel an impact, but, but the, the nature of the uh, agency that emitted it. You have no reference point for it. It's just a sound that you've never heard before. Yeah. But again, that gets back to what you were saying, is that if, if, if you can hear something, you've already, you already have a conceptual grid with which to understand it. Yeah, depending right. on where you hear it or how loud it is. I mean, the actual real, we wouldn't even perceive. We, we, but I don't know the realm of violate our bodies or we wouldn't even notice it. I mean, if he's like standing in the corner right now, he wouldn't even see it. So, it, you know, I, I'd love to think of an example from what the belief do we know in another movie that tells this true story, apparently, of um, an invading armada coming into uh, South America at, at some point. So the Spanish armada is an incredible number of ships on the horizon coming in and the native population went to the beach and they didn't see it. They saw little ripples in the water and they said, gosh, what, what's making that? And they looked out and didn't see it. Because they didn't know what to see. So to some extent we're, we're extremely hardwired to, to see what we know. One of the favorite things that I like to, to teach in terms of the difficulties to teach music is that very often when we're listening, I think we're more remembering than actually listening. So I think it's extremely hard to cut against the grain of memory and actually hear. Well, there was even a physical uh, border that we perceived sound. I 50, 100 milliseconds after we really physically perceive oh, yeah, yeah. it. And there's like physical border in uh, that something that sounds 100 milliseconds we hear uh, 100 milliseconds after it occurred. Right. That's extremely interesting to me, the slowness of sound compared to the speed of light. And I, I think it has very profound implications on how we process sound as opposed to how we process images. Because there's a sort of apparent instant, instant <coughs> to light. But um, we're, we're, we constantly are confronted with the slowness of sound. We can see somebody, and then a few seconds later, you I think it actually opens up epistemological depth acoustically in a very powerful way. It's, it's very late. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the comments. Thanks. Thank you.